Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, June 28th, 2012. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, is it better to add fruit to your mead in the primary or secondary fermenter? Home brewer and mead maker Tim Lieber joins us to share the tasty results of his experiment recorded in Seattle during the National Home Brewers Conference. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. In our 2012 Brewers Logbooks are still in stock, barely. Get yours while you can. You can, fill, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. My username is Basic Brewing, all one word. I'm out of practice. Also, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. And we have a uh, Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us first and click on our associate link on our site. It'll take you straight to Amazon where you can buy your stuff. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you this show, and we appreciate your support greatly. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site, too. You can find our uh, iPhone and Android podcast apps on the respective stores. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory, and we're on the Stitcher app, too. And I noticed that uh, Apple has a new podcasts app now for iPhone and uh, iPad as well. And uh, you can search for us, Basic Brewing, uh, or you can search under the food category as well. We had a great time in Seattle. Actually stayed at Bellevue. Uh, that's where the conference was, but it was a great, a great time at the Home Brewers Conference. Uh, Steve Wilkes, Andy Sparks, and I met many great folks, sampled many wonderful brews, and managed to actually learn a lot along the way, too. We recorded four audio episodes and four video episodes to share with you over the coming weeks. Many thanks to everybody who participated in the awesome content that we gathered. Uh, and I have to especially give a thank you out to Zod O'Connor, who graciously volunteered to drive us around and uh, show us some of the high points of the Seattle area. And you... Uh, you know, you can't. You go to these conferences, and sometimes you're just stuck in the stuck in the hotel, which is nice because there are good people and uh, good beer there. But you can't really get a local flavor uh, unless you get out and get around. So thanks again to Zot. Uh, you've got a lot to look forward to on Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video in the coming weeks. I want to say howdy to everybody who came up to us uh, to say hi uh, while we were at the conference. It was amazing how many folks took time to shake our hands and say that they listen to and or watch the podcasts. Um, I have to tell you that that kind of feedback is what keeps us going. You know, email is great. Uh, it's good to get in, in touch with people that way. But there's just something about face-to-face -face contact uh, and a smiling face that really makes it all more kind of real. Otherwise, we're, we're sort of working in a vacuum here. Uh, beer people are good people, as we, as we keep saying. Now, speaking of uh, email... Uh, thanks to a vacation time and, it's, and uh, time spent at the conference, I'm way behind again, even more behind than usual. So if you've sent me a message uh, in the past couple of weeks, please be patient. I'll try to get caught up by the end of the week. I also hope to uh, post a video episode by the end of the week as well. We'll, we'll probably start with Pro Night, as we usually do, and then Club Night, and then more stuff from the Seattle area. So stay tuned to your podcast feeds. Okay, why don't we get right into this week's interview? I'm, I'm running this out of order from when we recorded it uh, because uh, Tim Lieber said he was embargoing the data that he's been collecting uh, from his participants until it runs on this podcast. So I wanted to end the suspense for those who are waiting for it. Tim contacted me a while ago asking if I'd be interested in talking about his experiment uh, comparing fruit that was added to a mead in the primary and uh, in the secondary to see what uh, differences there were. And I said, yeah. Uh, Tim is uh, from the Seattle area, so it's very handy for us to meet up at the conference. Now, you'll have to pardon my hoarseness uh, on the recording, and apparently today, <laughs> I don't know what my excuse is today, but, but club night was the night before uh, we recorded, and uh, man, it was loud 
and there were a lot of folks to talk to, so I kind of blew out my voice. Uh, and, of course, y- you know that I'm joking, but I joke in the beginning that we had a large suite. We didn't, of course, <laughs> although the accommodations at the Hyatt uh, were very nice. And uh, the only thing I had to complain about was the cell phone reception. But that's another story that's not relevant. So let's get right in. <laughs> let's get right into the experiment, shall we? Here we are on a Saturday afternoon here at our palatial basic brewing uh, hotel suite again. Again with us are the usuals, uh, Steve Wilkes. As usual, Steve Wilkes. And Andy Sparks. Great to be here, James. And here, the, the bearer of good meads is Tim, Tim Lieber. Hi. T- and tell us where you're from and a bit of background on, uh, on your mead making abilities and your brewing abilities. I'm a local guy right here in Seattle. I live right across the lake in Madrona. Um, I'm originally from Kansas City, though. I've been brewing probably since 2002. I actually had a disastrous experience before that and then came back to the hobby. Um, I consider myself a mead maker primarily. Um, I actually started brewing because mead was taking so long. And then I started reading Ken Schramm's book and listening to people like Kurt Stock and guys and got that whole problem worked out. So I'm a much better mead maker, but I still brew a lot, too. Um, I'm a mead judge and a certified beer judge. So I I don't judge as much meat as I'd like because I tend to be entered in the competition. Mm-hmm. But if I'm not entered, I like to, to judge. So, And tell us what we got today. What I've done is um, when I was first starting to straighten out my techniques, I w- looked for a lot of advice about when to add fruit into melomels. And some people said you have to add it to the primary because that's the only way to get the real fermented flavor of the fruit. You know, that's the way to get the real thing. And I had other people who said, no, no, you want to put it in the secondary because in the second, you know, the primary, you've got all this gas evolving out and it's stripping out all the delicate aromatics from the fruit and all that's going out, out your bubbler and you're losing all that. So you put it only in the primary and both sides are pretty insistent. Well, I came around to fruit in the secondary, but then I've been thinking, well, maybe I ought to actually quantify this. I have a science background and I work as a data analyst, so I wanted numbers. So what I've done is I created a one must with 15 pounds of clover honey that I got at the local co-op, and uh, it was a five-gallon batch. And I added uh, two sachets of Lavalin 71B that I hydrated with GoFirm as per instructions. And then I also ha- did the first dose of staggered for, uh, nutrient addition all at the same time before I divided the must. Then I divided it in two. Um, first batch went into a, a large bucket with three pounds of organic raspberries. I got down to the farmer's market that I had frozen and then thawed. Oh, I also put uh, pectic enzyme up front. Um, put that in there, and the other half went into just a carboy, and they sat side by side in my fermentation chamber. I actually stuck the uh, probe right between the two, so it was reading as near as I could make it, both uh, vessels and let it go. And then when the primary fermentation was complete, I racked the meat off the raspberries into a carboy and cleaned cleaned the bucket real well and got everything nice and sanitary again. And then I racked the uh, the, pri- the primary that had been without fruit onto fruit that I had bought with the fruit from the second one. So the only real variable here is, you know, whether it was fruit in primary or fruit in the secondary. And they both got the same amount of time on the fruit give or take. There may have been a few days difference, you know, due to scheduling. And then I bottled, once they were all, you know, settled and cleared up and everything, because I individually racked a tertiary, I bottled it up and I've been uh, trying to get everybody's impression. And I run this thing where I bring in two bottles of meat and say, okay, what do you think? And uh, the results have been pretty definitive so far. Uh, And I've got lots of nice numbers to back it up. I don't have as much data as I'd like, but you know, 24, 25 odd data points, I think should be enough. (laughs) And these are people who know meads. Yeah. um, One, it went through one competition where it was judged by a master judge and a a recognized judge, I believe. Uh, But the master judge was a mead judge. A friend of mine who's a national judge is also a mead judge, judged them. And then it went through my, uh, both of my homebrew clubs. And uh, one homebrew club is very focused. We have a lot of people that are very interested in mead. 
Um, so there, and there's been a lot of discussion about it. So they're fairly knowledgeable. In my other homebrew club are guys that are just starting their brewing careers, mm-hmm. and they're not as meat, meat knowledgeable yet, but they were much better about what are your raw impressions, what do you think? Mm-hmm. And I asked everybody to score the meads on a stripped-down version of the mead score sheet, but also to state their preference, just to see if that made any difference. And then I've compiled it all into some nice charts. Now, on the process, uh, did you say whether the the fruit was pasteurized or not? I don't pasteurize anything. I'm I'm a no-heat guy. I freeze it for a while, and then I put it in the fridge to let it thaw in a Ziploc bag, and I hit it with a potato masher, and then I put it in right in the primary and I've never had a lick of trouble with that technique so but I don't heat the I only use water that is carbon filtered and then I heat it enough to kind of rinse out the honey containers but it hardly ever gets above 90 degrees and then by the time it's in that bulk of must you know that's why I believe in go firm because go firm's got that yeast up and running so when it hits that must it's ready to go so it doesn't take several days where the you know beasties might be able to creep in now, I won't ask you if you were surprised by the results yet, but did you have any preconceptions or expectations going in? Not initially. I did. I had no preconceptions about it at all because, like I said, both sides stated their case, and I had become a secondary fruit guy, but I, was, I had no expectations about it. When I tasted the finished results, I did form an opinion, and the data pretty much backs that up. But there is a surprise at the end that will kind of – discuss on the back end. Yeah, I notice you've got three different sets of bottles. <laughs> so we, we won't talk about that now then. Uh, is, is there any difference in the process as far as is one easier uh, to do, on the, you know, adding fruit to the primary or adding fruit to the secondary? Is there any benefit you know, besides the, the quality of the finished product? Well, when you have fruit in the primary, because you have all this active fermentation, you tend to form a fruit cap, which you have to punch down. But I'm degassing every day for the first two weeks, so that's not a problem. I mean, you want to degas before you add more nutrients to actively fermenting meat. I, I made that mistake once and spent two days mopping. <laughs> <laughs> because every time I thought I had it all done, I'd walk by again, and that floor is still sticky. <laughs> but <laughs> Sounds <all> familiar. <laughs> yeah, we've all done it, you know. <laughs> One of my mentors told me that there's two kinds of home brewers: those that have mopped a ceiling and those that will. <laughs> but uh, um, so the, you have to be much more active about the fruit cap management in the beginning with the primary. In the secondary, all that's done. And what you have to be concerned about is that all the, the fruit gets under the surface of the mead. And I just use some sanitized uh, glass marbles that I throw in the bottom of the bag so it all sinks. Okay. So the fruit is in a, is. You add the fruit in a bag. Yeah. I use a mesh bag because I got tired of cleaning fruit bits out of my racking canes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had a mead that I made with some peaches once and never got the fruit out of it. And then it was just, it was always a mess. So, But it was tasty. Yeah, well, it tasted great. <laughs> what you got out of the fermenter was yeah. tasty. <laughs> Any more thoughts? Uh, what we're going to do eventually is, is pause the recording and uh, do a tasting and get our thoughts together and then come back and, and kind of talk about what we, uh, what we think. But is there anything else that we need to know beforehand? I don't think so. I mean, it, it, like I said, it's, it's, there's these two different meads, and they're identical in every way except when the fruit was added. So I, I really don't think that right now we've got everything we need to proceed. Okay. We're just looking for are we, are we going to try to guess which is which? Or just preference, or I guess. I, yeah, I think you might want to try to figure out which one is which, and then which your preference is, because um, both of that's you know data points. But like I said, I've got a lot of data that I can provide, and yeah, I can email you the this, this information if you want to put it up. Yeah, we could do a PDF. Yeah, it's already a PDF. Oh, okay. cool. Business. Yay. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. All right. Well, we will pause and. Uh, We'll be, we will be back with looser tongues. <laughs> okay, we're back, and uh, I'll, I'll go last. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Don't make me. <laughs> Steve's got to say what Andy said. <laughs> I'll go first. I'm not chicken. I'm not okay. Chicken. 
Okay, so number one at uh, first? Or this, the, what was it? Our triangle. Our triangle. Uh, triangle, I, uh, my first few sips, I liked it quite well. My next few sips, I liked it quite less. Doesn't mean I didn't think it was bad, it just didn't grow on me. I thought it was, the fruit was nice, but it was subdued. I thought it was very wine-like. It reminded me of a bottle of, dare I say it, cheap, sweet red wine. It had a sweet red wine kind of thing. Uh, I thought it was a little hot. As I sipped on it and it opened up, I thought it was a little harsh. I thought it was a little chemically. And after I tasted the second one, which was, someone tell me what the symbol was, square, I thought it was really thin. And I didn't think it was thin until I tasted the second one. So once I had a comparison, then suddenly I went back to it and it was like, you know, drinking a giant, you know, uh, barley wine and then following it with Miller Lite, I'm like, well, there's nothing here. Mm. So that's my general impression of one. My general impression of the square was that it was much more fruity. The fruit was much nicer. It was much rounder. Uh, I really liked it a lot. I thought it was soft. I thought it was full. It was something I would be thrilled to share and thrilled to make. And so that's my unscientific way of saying that was a hell of a good mead. Andy? Yeah, um, okay, so I had similar um, impressions. The first one, um, when I smelled it, it had kind of, I could I could pick up a raspberry aroma, but it, it was very mild, and it, 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 to me it was more of a, almost a cooked raspberry, or in, and not quite as a fresh raspberry. Um, it was tart, uh, and let's see, I also I picked up a little bit of strawberry kind of character in it as well. When I when I had the second one, what what hit me first was the beautiful bright color. It had a better color. The first one was a little more faded. It didn't quite have as much brilliance as the second one. The second one was really impressive, kind of ruby colored, um, and it had a really incredible fresh raspberry aroma to me. It didn't. Um, it was like if you had smashed up a bunch of fresh raspberries and you put it in front of your face. Um, it really smelled delicious. And then when I tasted it, I could taste that same fresh raspberry aroma, um, which made me go back and put cooked raspberry on the other one. Maybe it wasn't like cooked like jam. It was just not quite as fresh. Um, those are my impressions. I have a technical question before I uh, do mine. Did, did the square and the triangle, did they finish out at the same final gravity? Um, uh, square finished out slightly higher um, for reasons which will be obvious when I reveal who's who. <laughs> but, yeah, they, they're fairly close, but square is a higher uh, f- final gravity. Yes, the square to me, which was the second sample, seemed, in tasting them back and forth, a fuller mouthfeel, uh, a bigger, uh, sweeter, juicier, everything. You know, when I first tasted uh, the triangle, which was the first one, I said... Uh, a fairly sweet, fruity aroma with a, with a delicate honey underneath, a tart uh, with a bit of sweetness with, um, what does that say? A ni- <laughs> <It's your laughs> a, I know, that's bad. Uh, a ni- oh, it says nice fruit character. So I thought, you know, I thought that's pretty good, you know. But then the second one came. And I said, oh, my. It was, first of all, noticeably darker, uh, much more pronounced fruit aroma, and it was a darker aroma. I mean, smelling it, you know, uh, it was a kind of a more rich, um, you know, less tart, uh, more developed uh, aroma, and then tasting it, oh, my. The fruit flavor was, was much more pronounced and complex uh, and rounder, and satisfying, and and I went back to the first one, as you did, and that, in comparison, I wrote thin and harsh, which, you know, starting from a, from a baseline, I enjoyed the first one until I tasted the second one, and then the first one, not so much. So, um, I, do we want to guess? We, I guess we, we have said which one we... we all three prefer the but second one. Which was the but which now was do we want to guess which was which? I'll go out on the limb here, and I'm going to probably be dead wrong. <laughs> but I'm going to guess that the fruit in the fermenter in primary was number one because it would have 
fermented all that stuff out and let all that wonderful flavor get away. I'm I'm thinking, and it cooked. It would cook in some sense the fruit. So there's just the cook in me. You know, the cook guy in me says keep that fruit in the secondary and it'll retain all that flavor and that color and all, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's my guess. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it, it, to me it seems like it's going to be obvious the second one had fruit in the in the secondary, um, but then we've been proven wrong before. Yeah. But that was, that's going to be my guess is the bright fruity one, the fresh fruity one is the one with, in the secondary where I where the fruit's left longer. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm going to assume. I'm assuming that that the second one had the fruit added in the in the secondary, but uh, you, you were yes, sir. Well, I was just gonna. I just there was a. Oh, I just <laughs> wanted to get the mic pointed in my direction at some point. I, I also just wanted to say that the first one, you know, going back and comparing, seemed hotter alcoholically. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know if the ABV was any different or not, for sure. Although you did say it was about fifteen, but it just seems like if that fruit's in there, then you're going to get. You're, you're going to get that fermentation. You're going to get that alcohol out of that fruit as well instead of having just the flavor extracted in the secondary. So that in some ways explains to me why it seemed a little hotter. But we, but we don't know yet, so maybe well, we... I just, <laughs> I'm just telling you my reasons for yeah, picking. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Right, okay. Well, now now, now comes the time where are we all three idiots? Or are we <laughs> you are wrong, chemical breath. <laughs> yes, that's right. You are wrong, raspberry breath. <laughs> okay, Tim. Are we full of beans? Or are we... Or no, you're dead on. Woo-hoo, woo. You know, the first one was fruit in the primary. And all my data shows... I mean, I have some people that prefer it. It's about 70% of the data set preferred fruit in the primary. But 83%... Uh, preferred the fruit in the secondary mead. So seven. What was that? Seventeen percent said fruit. The first. The first said one. Said fruit in the primary. Yes. Wow. Oh. Now there is something interesting in the data. I've I've got a spreadsheet. People out in podcast land can't see this, but maybe we'll get it out on the on well, the website. Yeah, we'll put it on the app and on the and on yeah. the site. But um, I've and I've color coded everything. So um, red is secondary and blue is primary. But I had two judges. One preferred the. Uh, um, they indicated they preferred the fruit in the secondary, but they scored the fruit in the primary higher. And another judge indicated a fruit an indi- a preference for fruit in the primary, and they scored fruit in the secondary higher. And I consider that a wash. But it is kind of an interesting bug in the data. Mm. Um, when I went back and evaluated the scores, originally I was going to try to do this with evaluating for are they a BJCP judge, are they a me judge. I, I didn't get enough data to do that. But... I calculated the median scores, and um, they're pretty consistent for everything except um, the flavor. There's, the flavor uh, is about four points higher um, in the median than um, fruit in the primary, and then the o- overall impression. Um, there's a little difference there, but really, appearance, there's, there wasn't a lot of difference, and aroma, there's not a lot of difference, but it's the flavor where it really comes out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also built, yeah, I looked at standard deviations around the scores, and I'm not going to bore everybody with the details, but the variability in the scores for the primary was a lot higher than the variability on the scores in the fruit in the secondary. Hmm. So then I went back and said, okay, well, let's look at the distribution of the scores. Again, I'm a data analyst for a living. <laughs> I, have a, I have a background in biology, so I'm a numbers guy. I like to see everything. And all this shows is that the the scores for fruit in the for the fruit in the secondary are clustered to the higher end of the scale, and the you know primary is on the lower end of the scale. So, but overall, I think our lowest score was a twenty five, and our highest was like a forty six. So, and that was primary and secondary respectively. So, it all you know, like I said, it was pretty conclusive. But honestly, when I tasted the meads and when I bottled, because I bottled them together on the same day, I knew which one I preferred. But then I thought, what about a third option? And I, so I get down and I have an even number of fruit in the primary, fruit in the secondary, and I've got about half gallon of, of both left. And I thought, hmm, what if I blended these two together? I knew it! So 
Uh, we did another one we didn't talk about up front called, uh, that was labeled Circle. And Circle is a blend of the two. Now, I'd be interested in your impressions of Circle as opposed to the first. I wish I'd have written it down. I wish I'd have written it down because I, I said this is – oh, in fact, I did. What did I say? Mine is – It's over. It's gone. Oh, there it is. <laughs> What's the ABV on these? Uh, it's, it's 15, give or take. The secondary is going to be lower. The, the primary is going to be higher. But it's about a point of, of alcohol per pound in a five-gallon batch. Yeah. So what I, what I wrote down was somewhere in between triangle and square in aroma and flavor. I wrote down very much like two, but two is better. You know, I basically, you know, took some notes. I said nice raspberry aroma, not quite as fresh as the, se as the second one we did. Um, the color is closer to the secondary, second one, but not quite as brilliant. Um, it had better f raspberry flavor than the first, but not better than the second. Mm. My speculation was not a blending of the two, but my thought was that you, when you tasted these, the, the, the first one, we all basically pulled out a tartness. Mm. Um, and then I was thinking, wow, maybe... If you added maybe 25% of the fruit during primary and then 75% into the secondary so that you develop some of these characters that were in one that were not necessarily unpleasant, obviously some people actually like some of those things. And that might brighten up the flavor because it's a little tartar. Anyway, that's kind of what I thought it was going to be. It was kind of maybe a combination of both, but maybe not a 50-50 split. Yeah, this is what I thought of too. <laughs> it's a smiley face. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a <laughs> useful data point in some way. <laughs> Which is an inside joke from earlier. Yeah. But actually, when I talked to people, because when I ran this experiment, except for when it went through the judging, I then had people blend the two back together. And most everybody preferred the blend above either of the two. Oh, oh really? Because really, when I taste one, I taste it's fruity and it's bright, almost acidic. But it's a little bit astringent. There's some of the, mm -hmm. some of the seeds are astringent. And it's alcohol warming. It kind of drops off very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, the sec for the secondary is much sweeter, but it, to me it's a bit flabby. You know, yeah. it, oh. it just kind of carries yeah. on. It's darker in color, but it's more juicy and more fruit aroma. But it's almost cloying. Mm -hmm. But when they're balanced together, when they're blended together, it's more balanced. Uh, the astringency is not overwhelming. It actually balances out that sweetness, so it kind of fades out together, yeah. and um, it. The astringency then gives structure to the flabby mead. Mm. Yeah. So, and it's it's in the middle of the sweetness between the two, of course, because it's a blend of the two. So, where I've actually come around in this experiment is I am now adding half the fruit in the primary, half uh -huh. the fruit in the secondary. So that is my new process, and I think you know these numbers bear out that approach. Very yeah. interesting. Well, could you get over that flabbiness with just some acid blend or something like that? Is that you know, it, would that be a, a way to, to deal with that portion of it? Yeah, I had a, a meat tasting the other night out at a friend's house in Oak Harbor, uh, Mark Tanner, and uh, Gordon Strong was there, and I had a mead that I found in the back of my cellar that was a hydromel I made with mesquite honey back in 2006. And, you know, Gordon's a great guy. I don't know him very well, but, you know, he's, he's very patient with people who come up and go, try my beer. <laughs> And so he, he drank it, and he, he looked at my friend Mark and goes, do you have any uh, phosphoric acid? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we ended up putting a little lemon in because it was a little flabby. Mm -hmm. uh, but apparently, and he's also said in the speech that he thinks phosphoric is like the most neutral acid to add mm -hmm. in terms of flavor. I have not tried it myself, um, but I have I've kind of gotten away from the whole, well, you, you put in this much nutrient, you put in this much acid blend, and you let it ferment because I'm – have experiments in mind around those things, but I just don't think they're very useful to my mead making techniques. And what I'm trying to do now is quantify what I've learned. Mm -hmm. So, like when I tell somebody this is what you should do, and they go, "Well, I don't agree with you," I can, well, I got this spreadsheet. You see, <laughs> we got some data. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, uh, and plus, uh, you're doing it your your new way with adding half and half. You're, you're doing it in a more natural fashion. You're letting yeah. the, the nature take its course and coming out with something that is something that you find pleasing. So uh, that to me s seems like a more, I guess, organic or, or natural way to, to do things. You know, and I would say that all three of these meats, I think, are, are quite nice, but they have a different use in on the table. Mm. Uh, so mead number one, I probably would not serve as an aperitif or as a dessert, 
but I would definitely serve it alongside uh, some light red meat or a light, you know, there's, there's meals that would go really well with that. So for my palate, I mean, I, I understand everybody's palate's different. So, you know, I just, you know, the, the first one was just so much more like drinking kind of a light red acidic wine, mm-hmm. where the other two were so much more like drinking mead. Yeah, I guess I was I was just suckered in with the sweetness. Uh, where I can I can see your point that <clears throat> maybe you wouldn't want a whole glass of it. Uh, it might get tiring after a while. To all the the mm-hmm. kind of heaviness and sweetness. Uh, so maybe some maybe some balance over the long haul of a of a full glass would yeah would uh, be better. Okay. I I'm still I I like the sweet. I like the the raspberry. When I think raspberry, I, I kind of want it to be juicy. I yeah. want it to, t- you know, it's a real bright, aggressive f- little flavor, and I want to taste that, you know. So what do, we, what do we think is going on? I mean, why why is this happening? I, I think what's going on and is that when the, meat are ac- when the yeast are actively fermenting, the, um, the, the minerals and vitamins and all that in the... Uh, fruit provided an extra punch so it really goes one of the things i noticed is when i pulled those raspberries out of the primary it was pretty much down to seeds and some fluffy pulp i mean it was really they had really worked it down and when i pulled the raspberries out of the secondary they were not what they were but they were much more intact much more whole than they had been so i think the yeast are taking advantage of the extra nutrients because honey is very nutrient poor that's why we add nutrients to it to make yeast mead and i think they're taking advantage of that also there's sugars in the raspberry i mean everybody thinks raspberry is tart but it's there's quite a bit of sugar there that help drive that forward and of course there are fruit acids that help drive all that forward now left to its own devices the you know that 71b stops at a certain point i mean it could be pushed you know i've I've had meads with 71b that are up at 18 percent not on purpose mind you but (laughs) but they've gotten that high and I think without without that that extra nutrient source that they can chew on for a very long time, they just kind of reach a point where they stop. And of course, when I before I go to secondary, I uh, cold crash and sulfite. Actually, I sulfite, let it sit 24 hours, then I cold crash in the freezer, and then I rack. So at that point, those yeast are pretty much either dead or in the tube that I'm racking off of. Mm-hmm. So there's very little yeast to then pick up fermentation again. And I started doing that because when I was adding all my fruit to the secondary, I'd think, oh, I'm having this great. I'd come by the carboy, and it's just bubbling like crazy again, and I'm losing what I, what I wanted to do. I, I do want to say that one of the nice things about this experiment is we've talked about who prefers what. Well, if anybody out there doesn't like a sweet mead but wants that berry character, they should put all their fruit in the primary. Mm-hmm. because they'll, they're still going to get something nice. Now, they may want to back sweeten a little bit or, you know, come up with, you know, want some way to counteract that acid or just leave it there because it's really, until you taste of the second one, the first one did not seem harsh and thin. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Agree. So they can do that. And if you really want all that juicy, fruity sweetness, put it all in the secondary. Sure. I'm looking for a more balanced, nuanced product, you know. But, again, I'm also looking at something to take to parties and, you know. Right. You know, say, hey, girls, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as Michael Fairbrother says, it works. <laughs> now, uh, I, could it be, and, and, and maybe, maybe you've already touched on this, but could it be that uh, when you put the fruit in the primary, it chugs along, and uh, there's this equal, e- equal amount of, or, or there's a balanced amount of sugars from the fruit and the, and the honey, and the yeast eats on those equally as it goes along. And then if you put it in the secondary, maybe the yeast is getting tired at that point, and there may be a ratio of more unfermented berry sugars as opposed to unfermented honey sugars. Well, I think there's unfermented sugars from both sources in, when you put it in the secondary because the, the yeast petered out, and they were both done. And I, you know, kept track of how much time so I could leave it in the secondary the same amount. But they both had stopped primary fermentation and weren't bubbling anymore. And the the one that was just primary as just a mead mm-hmm. was sweeter at that point than the one that had the raspberries on it. But, I mean, it was still wow. noticeably sweet. Mm-hmm. It Interestingly enough, it did not get any sweeter tasting when I added the raspberries because I think the 
actually got a little drier because the the fruit acids and all the raspberries, mm-hmm. you know, because raspberries they start kind of dried it up a little bit, kind of, you know. But so I don't think it got any, any. It didn't get definitely didn't ferment anymore, and I don't think it got any sweeter. But it also didn't get a lot drier. You know, it just kind of stayed where it was. Hmm. Interesting. I'm There's a lot I don't know. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a story later. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm just curious how how long uh, from start to finish, how many days went by with these meads? It was about um, because I wanted to make sure everything was well and done. It was a month for each. Mm-hmm. So you know, I, I gave it extra time um, to make sure it was really done. But again, like I said, I degas these things about every other day before I added nutrients and I did the staggered additions to help drive that you know through to the finish so and you know that's a if you've never done that before folks you need to do that you need to do that Um, and it really got everything you know moving along but I wanted to make sure you know a nice convenient timeline and it was number of days it was about 30 days each but I ended up having to work late on the 30th day for the fruit in the secondary and it might have gone another day or so but they live side by side and I don't think that extra day makes a lot of difference to the final results and what temperature did you ferment it I ferment everything at um, the active fermentation went at 64 degrees Fahrenheit Um, I when I put things in the secondary again because this is the technique I developed I generally will go down to uh, 54, 52, generally. You know, I ferment, I primary at basically L temperature, and then I secondary basically lager temperature, but not lager fermentation temperature, not lagering temperature. Right. 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 And um, that's just the routine I've developed, and it, it works for me. You know, your mileage may vary, mm-hmm. yeah. but it, it it's been doing all right for me. Well, there were certainly, certainly no defects in, in any of these. Uh, I think it's just a matter of, uh, of personal preference or taste preference. I mean, there weren't hot alcohol. Well, you know, I didn't taste any fusel. I, you know, there was nothing in there that was disagreeable to me uh, from the from the quality of the of the product. I think yeah. it was just a matter of the balance of the the tartness and the sweetness, and and uh, very interesting. I was just so impressed with the lusciousness of the of actually the, the second and third of circle and square. Is that square right? and circle. Square and circle. And just uh, uh, and all three were nice. Like I said, it just amazes me how wonderful mead is. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. really becoming enamored of mead. And mm-hmm. when I meet folks like you that do it well, it, it's very inspiring. Yeah, this is an excellent experiment. Uh, I'm intrigued by it, and I, I think it's really interesting. And it would be fun to kind of play with those ratios. You know, like mm-hmm. you're saying. You know, maybe 25%, maybe go the other way, maybe 75%, 25%. I don't know. I mean, it's pretty interesting, and, and it probably will lead you to a lot of different uh, different uh, fun, interesting flavors. Do you have any uh, any plans to try to re- – I mean, you're a data guy. Yeah. You're going to repeat the experiment? Um, I've still got more uh, bottles uh, stashed in, the, in my uh, cellar, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get all of those out into – competitions or in front of people and get it all evaluated but honestly the people I put this in front of I told them well I want to you know kind of do this and get it all together and kind of talk about it all at once and um, they've been chomping at the bit <laughs> for, you know for the for the information so I'm gonna have to at least tell them and it would be interesting I mean to you know scientists repeat you know repeatability is the is the uh uh, as the key to confirming, and, and it would be uh, uh, you know interesting to do it with another fermentation, maybe with a different fruit, yeah. or you know maybe different gravities, or you know, and then f- maybe re- farm it out to other uh, other mead makers as well, and try to get some sort of uh, confirmation across the board. You know, this is I think it's you've got the data that that uh, there's a there's a preference for this particular experiment, yeah. this particular session, but. Uh, it would be uh, interesting and useful, I think, to confirm that. Yeah, I think it would be. I've, I've got a few people I want to talk, try to talk into doing that. I have some friends that are some pretty good mead makers. And, you know, the other goal is I want to get these also into other competitions where there are really people that know something about mead um, just to get that feedback um, from people. 
but I've got a whole list. I, I want to do what's it like to put all the nutrients up front because everybody says now you do staggered additions. And mm -hmm. I want to see, really taste what difference that makes. I'm convinced from my, you know, just personal experience that you want to go with staggered additions, but I want to be able to quantify what that difference is. Or um, boil versus no boil. You know, what difference does that make? And just play with one or two, one of these variables at a time mm -hmm. and see what we get. And um, I'd, I'd like to do this with more people and different fruits, but right now I've got a blackberry melon mel going that is, um, I did fruit in the primary, fruit in the secondary. The other thing I do is I use a fair amount of fruit. This was each batch, two and a half gallon batch, got three pounds of raspberries. Mm. So And honey's not cheap either. Honey's not cheap either, but I know somebody who was working at the co-op at the time, and they had a they had some honey in a bucket that had basically crystallized. Uh. And they're like, well, you're a bean maker. You, you know, <laughs> boss will sell this to you cheap on sale. I'm like, well, how cheap? And it was <laughs> came out to a couple bucks a pound. So I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll take 15 pounds of that. Yeah. I, I've, I've got this network out. You know? <laughs> Do you know a beekeeper? Do you keep bees? Every farmer's market, I walk up to the guy with honey and go, how much can I buy at once? They go, oh, we got this quart bear. I'm like, no. Don't talk to me if it's not a gallon. <laughs> you know, I want a gallon, and I want it cheap because I don't care how crystal clear it is. In fact, I prefer it cloudy. So, you know, but I know people who, who are all over, and, you know, we just keep an eye out for where honey is. And anytime I'm at a fruit stand somewhere, I look for the honey. I found uh, apple blossom honey up over the hills and uh, towards Wenatchee. I'm not turning loose of where that is. <laughs> but I was going to say you're giving away a lot of secrets. Here. No, no, it's it's well, all the there's a lot of all the apple trees and every all the fruit orchards are over, are somewhere over towards Wenatchee. So it's you know like telling somebody, well, there's a nickel somewhere, <laughs> somewhere on that block, somewhere on that block, <laughs> you know. But um, so I'm making a mead with that, and so that's kind of what. I'm, but I'm always looking for you know the honey or the fruit. But like I said earlier. The organic berry guy has got my number. Mm. I show up at the farmer's market. He's like, we have got raspberries and blackberries. <laughs> and right now he's got these little strawberries that are like the size of your thumb or smaller. And they're, oh, they're just so intense and juicy. And yeah. everyone's always said, well, you can't make strawberry meats tough because it, it's fleeting. It's, you know, just such a fragile thing. And I'm thinking, I bet you if I put 12 pounds of strawberries, <laughs> you, get it. you know, and throw it in there. I bet you that it'd work, you know. <laughs> Last summer I made about four batches of jam with it, though, so. Mm. Well, this has been a lot of fun and very, very informing. Much. And uh, if you do another experiment, uh, you know, let us know. And uh, we'd, we'd love to at least hear your data and would really love to, to taste the samples again. I'd be more than happy to. All right. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, Andy. And thank you, Steve. And you're welcome. It's always great to be here. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> well, thanks again to Tim for sharing his work with the experiment. I will be posting his PDF on the site and, and uh, on the, uh, the app as well. Uh, and I'm hoping that Tim will include us on future experiments. He's a very talented guy. And nice guy as well. Uh, and as usual, thanks again to Steve and Andy for the use of their palettes. I know it's tough, tough work, but, you know, you, you made it through. <laughs> and uh, we, we got some, Tim had some extra bottles, so we were able to bring some of those back. And we'll be sharing those with folks here at home. More from uh, the National Homebrewers Conference next week. I hope you have a safe and happy Fourth of July. And uh, even if you don't celebrate it in your country, I hope yours is safe and happy as well. <laughs> in the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And uh, be sure to check your spam folder if you've written to me and uh, think you haven't heard from me. <laughs> it happens a lot. Uh, be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site along with our Brewer's Logbook, which I say is going, going, almost gone. We've got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. 
You can check out our basic brewing shirts in the store, too. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Premium Bourbon Madagascar Vanilla Beans and Aerobed Sleep Basics Elevated Queen Bed. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget, you can also join the American Homebrewers Association or subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine. You can do both uh, through the associate link on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. So long.